Preschool Radio and its corresponding affiliate take pride in presenting me, Dr. Oliver Brolin Ponsonby Esquire, your host for the Cadmium Stage of the Skies. Great drama for a great new medium. On this hour's program, artist Morph B. Mann shares with us another war zone tall tale, a battlefield myth, a story of the restlessness of spirit that permeates the battlefronts, almost as if the soul of certain enlisted cannot find peace. This is the Frontline Ghosts. Written, edited, and voiced by Moth B. Men. I've traveled the entirety of the Mercy Valley and beyond during my myriad of careers as a soldier and a journalist. And I can tell you, with all the folks I've met around the regions, there's always been stories told around the campfire of strange happenings, phenomena that are attributed to folklore and old traditions, passed down from senior to junior soldier. Through all the tumultuous conflict this area sees, sometimes these stories seem to pop up with similar points of interest. This one in particular, I know many of you soldiers have seen firsthand. I myself have seen this phenomena here in the Mercy Valley at least several times. I remember my first encounter with the beings. It was during a protracted engagement at Reaching Trail when I first saw them. Long, winding dugouts and trenches carved into the frozen earth protected the heads of shivering masses of Orden soldiers, withstanding a head-on assault by Colonial Army. Artillery strikes and tank shells seemed to be the only ordnance capable of cracking open the ground, due to the permafrost that had gotten deep into the soil of the area. As I ducked behind a destroyed tank, I could see the artillery creeping closer and closer to the Warden lines. Clods of dirt and ice showered the trench, a shell after shell seemed to step closer, eventually reaching inside of the trench itself. At the same time, a warden officer had brought his whistle to his lips to signal his last command, a desperate charge to get his men out of the awful fight. As the whistle sounded, an artillery shell suddenly silenced the officer, along with the rest of his men in that trench. The smoke kicked up from the ordnance seemed to linger, cribbing low along the ground before gently rising up beyond the heads of the men, an artificial fog of war. The area fell silent, save for the distant gunshots of fighting elsewhere. As the men peered across the frozen field to the trench line, they noticed there was still movement, but it was slow, deliberate, as if something else compelled them to rise up from their positions. Slowly, they climbed out of the trench and walked forward, unarmed. At first, the Legion wondered if they were surrendering, and they lowered their weapons to see what they would do after one of them ordered them to stop. stop. Silence. The men walked forward slowly, almost at a shuffling pace, as the gun smoke cleared to reveal that all of these men were unscathed, that a single stitch on their uniforms were out of place, their uniform buttons shone against the white snow. Their helmets glinted against the sunlight. Fifteen men abreast, walking slowly as they came to the top of the hill. Again, another soldier told them to stop and put their hands up, but they received no answer. Clearly annoyed at this, the soldier brought his rifle up and fired at the warden officer who was still clutching the whistle up to his lips. But it was as if the bullet had no effect. The round traveled through him and hit another man, 
kicking up dust behind the troop. But still, they walked forward. Another gunshot, then another. Soon, the entire colonial platoon resumed firing. And yet these warden soldiers simply walked past them, heading towards the tree line. One of the Legion soldiers attempted to apprehend one of the men, only to notice the man who he was attempting to restrain seemed to have almost superhuman strength. The collie was unable to even move the man's arm, and he received a heavy shoulder check as a result, knocked him to the ground. Another rushed up with the butt of his weapon and struck the officer in the face, who then decided to remark that his head was like slamming his weapon into a metal bulkhead. Eventually, the legionnaires relaxed and let the warden unit disappear into the tree line, where they seemed to vanish beyond the low branches of the pines. Another soldier during the commotion had made his way to the trenches, and gasped aloud in horror as he brought a gloved hand to his mouth, as if to refrain from vomiting. As we approached the trench, we realized something both grim and strange. There they were, all fifteen men, a mangled mess of blood and limbs, bits of cloth and polished metal caught between the slats of wood and duckboard. The stench of cooked offal billowed out from the shell crater left behind from the artillery strike, and we all seemed transfixed on a single object resting among all the carnage. A whistle, still gripped by the hand of the recently deceased warden officer, stained with his own blood. Had it been an isolated incident, it would have ended there. But there is a myriad of accounts from all sides remarking on isolated incidents of men who do nothing but press forward straight into the enemy's ranks long after death, then disappear as quickly as they appeared. While that alone is strange, and clearly something of a supernatural phenomena of soldiers incapable of being stopped by conventional means, A more curious scenario is when they are stopped. One account in particular remarks of a column of dead colonial soldiers marching out of abandoned war towards Callahan's Passage. At least three squads were marching side by side, singing softly as they walked uphill towards the warden positions. As the gun nests opened fire on the column, the warden garrison reacted, believing it to be a concerted assault. Green ash was deployed as well as heavy machine guns, mortars, and artillery. Nothing fazed these men as they shoveled through the wall of lead that came upon them, just like a thunderbolt. It wasn't until they reached the retaining wall of the fob that they came to a stop. They pressed their noses against the wall and continued to drive their legs into it. And once those impervious beings suddenly began to bleed from the force they were exerting upon themselves, right into the bulwark... But even under apparent excruciating pain, they continued to drive their feet and legs against the wall until their skulls had caved in against it. Headless, these beings still pressed forward. This macabre display was enough to force the wardens to cease fire and simply witness the beings pressing themselves between the slats of wood, through the dirt between them, and coming to their final resting place as a puddle on the other side of the wall. Their voices still carrying the dulcet tones of men long since departed. They were singing. Military provisional governments of both sides issued proclamations stating that if these beings are sighted, they were to be captured and held in containment until investigators can address the situation properly. This has been the Frontline Ghosts, written, directed, and voiced by Moth Men. Join me. Dr. Oliver Poland Ponsonby Esquire, 
Next time we receive enough funding for the Cadmium Stage of the Skies. Skies.